Let us pray. Most gracious and merciful God, we do come rejoicing, rejoicing in the hope of the expectant birth of our risen Lord and Savior. God, allow this day to be a day full of hope. Allow this day to be a day where we can experience your love and then share that love with the world. God, we pray this prayer in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let us unite in the historic confession of our Christian faith. It's found in our bulletin, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this you come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Children here, if you'll come up, some of our children have been preparing to make a little presentation, and Miss Hannah's going to lead them in that, and then we will get together to light the Advent candles. I'm going to go get it. about joy and this is a special time of year to really remember why we have joy in our lives. We have been memorizing a scripture verse that explains why we celebrate this time of year and my friends are going to help me um, tell it to y'all. Are y'all ready? Yeah! All right. Luke? Luke The angel said to them, Today our Savior Christ the Lord was born in David's city. This is how you'll recognize him. You'll find an infant wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly a large army of angels appeared with the angel. They were praising God by saying, Glory to God in highest, and on earth have peace and it's good will. All right, thank you. All right, let's go see Reverend Charles at the end. This way. If there are any other children, I invite y'all to come down as well. Yeah, um, so last week we lit the first candle. Do y'all remember we lit the first candle over here on our Advent wreath? And remember, we said that each of these four candles represents a word. And that the first two weeks are hope and peace. And that the third week, y'all are learning about joy, will be the, the pink or rose candle. And then um, and hope, peace, joy, and love. And then we've got the Christ candle. So this week, we're going to light the first two candles of hope and peace. And then I promised you, if you would come back this week, there would be a surprise for you. Huh? Let's see if that was good. There it goes. So what I want to have for each of you is to be able to remember, have a little something to take home with you. 
and I've got a little nativity set for each of you. And I want you to find a place in your room, maybe on a bedside table or Thank near you. where your bed is. You're welcome, sweetheart. Thank you, You're welcome. You're very welcome. Y'all are all so polite this morning. And we've got plenty for all of our friends that are not here this morning. So they're gonna, if we've got a lot of friends that come some weeks and don't come others. So we've got plenty and we've got one for, for any of the other children that are in here this morning. And so, so who's, who, do y'all know who's in, in this nativity scene? Who's that? Mary and Joseph. And who else? Baby Jesus. Baby Jesus and a nana. Is that a donkey or a cow? I can't tell. I think it's a donkey. I think it, it, it would it could be one or the other. And so, th- so this is this is for you to be able to think about the real reason for Christmas. And so I want you to find a place in your room or somewhere where you can share it with your family. And guess what? I've got another. Maybe unexpected thing for you next week too. So y'all come back next week and we'll have something else unexpected for you. Will y'all bow your heads? Let's have a word of prayer. Y'all repeat after me. Dear God, God, thank you you for the gift of joy. joy. Thank you also also for unexpected gifts. gifts. Help us us to to learn and to know the true meaning meaning. of Advent Advent. and Christmas. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Y'all can either return to your seats or head out to Children's Church. Good job, Ms. Hazel.
may be seated. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, I want to invite you to see the back of your bulletin for our prayer list and remembering all those uh, that, that are on our prayer list. And, and uh, mo- most uh, importantly this morning, I want to update um, you on Bobby Reagan. Um, Bobby had quadruple bypass surgery on Friday uh, just at uh, Emory Midtown here in town and is doing quite well following surgery and we are very grateful for that. He will be in the hospital a few more days and then go home to recover but wanted to, uh, many of you were aware that he was having surgery and so I wanted to give you that update. Um, Certainly as we come together on a more global nature, we remember um, and give thanks and celebrate the life of Nelson Mandela who died this week and um, uh, undoubtedly left an indelible mark on the world with his work in South Africa and for freedom um, and for peace and reconciliation. And so we, uh, we certainly give thanks for that life well lived this morning. If there are other prayers of celebration or concern that you would like to share with us this morning, we invite you to find a prayer request card located in the pew backs in front of you. And fill that out, place it in the offering plate when it comes by, and also if you've not yet done so, if you would, Please uh, fill out the attendance registration that's in the insert in your bullets, and you can tear that off, place it in the offering plate when it comes by in just a little bit as well. Will you bow with me now as we go to God in prayer? Almighty God, we are a little deeper into our journey toward Bethlehem. Undoubtedly, for many of us, the days are becoming busier. For some of us, shopping has been done for weeks, and for others, it's not yet begun. Some of us have a pretty quiet, peaceful time, while others are stretched from one celebration to another. Oh God, for some, it's a joyous time of spending time with family and friends, and for others, it's a difficult time remembering the loss of those close to us, going through difficult times. And so, God, in the midst of this morning, we recognize that we all come here, each from a different place, each experiencing this season in a different way. So, God, we know that you celebrate alongside those who are celebrating and you mourn alongside those who are mourning and you hold all of us in the palm of your hand. Oh God, we certainly remember the life of Nelson Mandela and for all those men and women in our world who seek to bring peace and justice for we know that you are a God of peace and a God of justice and that you desire more than anything for us to love one another as you have loved us. And oh God, that is really what this Advent season is all about. It's bringing us back to the very basis and basics of our faith. To remember that Christ came into the world as a child, as an infant, as a baby, grew and learned and taught and preached and died and rose again, that we might have life and have it abundantly. Oh God, this time of year is set aside for us to once again look at our priorities, to make sure that we are spending the time, our time on the things that make the most difference, family and friends, and investing in others. God, we continue to be mindful of those who serve us in so many ways. During this holiday season, as we go from Thanksgiving to Advent to Christmas, for those who are away from their families for so many reasons, bring them home, O oh God. And if they can't come home in time for Christmas, may they have the ability to communicate with their families. May you keep all safe. God, we thank you for the many gifts of this season. And we offer back to you just a small portion of all that you've given of us with your tithes and our offerings. We offer these our prayers and these our gifts in the name of Christ, the child who is to come and who will come again and who taught us that when we gather we should pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke's Gospel, the first first chapter, beginning in the fifth verse. Out of respect for the reading and hearing of God's Word, I invite you to stand as you're able. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. He was a descendant of Aaron, and his wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink, even before his birth. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to turn their hearts of the... He, excuse me, he will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before them to turn the hearts of their parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I am standing in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute unable to speak until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did not come out, he could not, when he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them, but he remained unable to speak. When the time of his service had ended, he went home with his wife. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of the unexpected things of aging is the last two years my eye doctor said I need bifocals and it may be time. I'm, I'm having a harder time getting from one line to the other, so forgive me for that. So this is a wonderful, wonderful text. Interestingly enough, as um, I think I've shared with some of you, and some of you may be aware, is that, that there is this, um, the lectionary readings, there are three-year rotation of readings um, that many preachers use to guide their, their preaching. I, I don't use that on a regular basis. This time of year, I will, I will consult it and see which ones fit. But interestingly enough, this particular text is not included in the lectionary. It's not a text that's prescribed any time during Advent or any time else during the year. But I felt it was such a critical, critical text to us. For those that weren't here last week and for those who it's been a whole week since then, I want to kind of bring us up to speed. We have our sermon series on this unexpectation. And, and uh, what we're trying to do is trying to find those unexpected things that take place as we prepare for the coming of Christ. And we want to make sure we have set the proper expectation of what is coming into the world and and how Christ will meet us in unexpected ways. So last week, we actually were were in Matthew's gospel and we were later in the gospel when Jesus talks about the second coming of Christ. 
And it said that the Son of Man will come at an unexpected hour. And we began our Advent journey speaking about those things in our lives that are unexpected. And we're continuing with that theme this morning in this, the first chapter of Luke's gospel. And here we meet this wonderful couple, Zachariah and Elizabeth. And and Zachariah is a priest. And in in this day and time, we need to kind of understand that there were about 20,000 priests throughout the country. And they were broken down in, in, in roughly about 24 groups of a little less than 1,000 each. And we, we get this ordering from our Old Testament uh, ordering of these things. But we know there were about 20,000 priests and that, that they were about 24 groups of, of a little less than 1,000 that made them all up. And they rotated turns serving at the temple. And when it was their group's turn, and we learned from our text this morning that he was of the priestly order of Abijah. So when it was that group's turn to serve, then all those priests would come together to the temple, and then they would cast lots to determine which priest would actually go into the temple to burn incense. It was was really a -a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Casting lots literally was like rolling dice. And, And so for a priest to have this privilege was huge and tremendous. And so on this particular day, as Elizabeth and Zechariah had traveled and as he was there to serve, it became his turn to go in and offer incense, to present all of the people's offerings to God that God might accept the people's prayers and their sacrifices. It seems all all a bit mystical to us. If most, you know, if you grew up in the maybe in the Anglican tradition or the Episcopal church, then you might have grown up with, with incense in the sanctuary. Uh, when a, a, the, the person will come and a uh, thurifer will come in and, and, and have the, the pot with the smoke that is emanating from it, and they'll walk in and they'll surround the altar with smoke, and it does look very mystical. Now, if you grew up like me in the Methodist church, I never really had any experience with that until I was, had the opportunity to worship in some other traditions uh, during my time in seminary and since. But it is, if you've ever been to a worship service when they did that, there is this kind of mystical moment. But think about you being the only one. You've gone into this small room or this room in the back of the temple and it's just you. And you are presenting all of the prayers and the sacrifices and the wishes and the hopes of all the people. And then they're all standing outside praying while you're inside. And then I would imagine that that human condition comes into order. I could imagine being overwhelmed knowing that you were really in and, and could palpably sense the presence of God and that might utter a prayer on your own or for yourself or for your family. Now, we're not told exactly what Zechariah was praying for, and we're not told exactly what the people were praying for, but we know that they were immersed in prayer. We talk about prayer from time to time in in worship and in other ways. I want to take an opportunity to, to help us remember kind of my take on prayer. One is that there are no rules about prayer. People come to me and ask me, how should I pray? Now, we we prayed the Lord's Prayer, and when the disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray, Jesus presented them with the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. But Jesus also modeled prayer by simply going off on his own and finding places where he could be quiet and in solitary. He also gave us us models for uh, corporate prayer, where we could all come together and pray. But what I want you to know is that there are no hard and fast rules. And there are no specific words. And there's nothing that is out of line or off base to pray to or with God for. The most simple prayer, form of prayer is just putting ourselves in the presence of God and listening for God's voice. But certainly we can pray for our own needs, the needs of our family and friends, the needs of the world. We can give thanks 
for the blessings of life. These are all ways that we can offer prayer. And what we know is that, that there was tremendous prayer going on while Zechariah him, found himself offering incense in the sanctuary of the Lord. He's in the midst of this incredibly emotional, powerful moment of prayer, offering incense, and then suddenly someone else was there. Now, we've all been startled by an unexpected visitor. Generally, when we're most startled is when we expect it the least. Generally, that's either when, some, when it's very quiet or we really believe we're alone or we're alone and it's quiet and it's dark. That is a time when I think each of us can think about having been caught off guard I know that for me, that, it, that there's times when I come into the sanctuary during the week. I'm looking for Ariel to see where he went. He may have stepped out for a moment. Was he, oh, he's all the way around the corner. So one of the things that, that is a blessing of, of being a pastor in a church in, in which your office is so close to the sanctuary is that throughout the week, Ariel comes to rehearse. And so as I'm sitting in my office, I can hear this incredible music emanating from the sanctuary. It, it's an incredible gift to, to hear him and hear either at the, at, the, at, the, at the organ or up in the music rehearsal space on the piano. Ariel becomes so immersed in what he's doing, and I want to come and thank him, and, and, but I also am careful and, and mindful that when I walk in the sanctuary or I walk up to his his music rehearsal space, he's so immersed in it that he's unaware of what's going on around him. And I do my best to kind of come in and, and, and let him know that I'm here so that I don't cause him to fall off the organ bench. We've all come upon other people who didn't know we were there and we're trying to figure out how to let them know we're there without startling them. And we've all been in that position when we thought we were all alone and we were isolated and unexpectedly someone appears. And in this case, it's an angel of the Lord. Properly translated, the word's messenger, and the messenger can be human or the messenger can be angelic. And in this case, the messenger is angelic. But the presence of this angel absolutely scares Zechariah Unbelievably so. He wasn't expecting. He was immersed in prayer. He was focused on the incense and on the presence of God. And suddenly, there was an angel. If you know anything about the Christmas story, you know that this happens several times during the stories. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, to Mary, to Joseph, the shepherds, to us, but first in Luke's gospel, to Zechariah. And the angel always says, do not be afraid. So I have to take this moment to remind everybody of my favorite Christmas special, which is the Peanuts Christmas special, a Charlie Brown Christmas in that famous scene when Linus walks out onto the middle of the stage to recite from Luke's gospel the Christmas story. And if you've been here in years past, you will recall this story, but I think it's an important one to remember. Linus was always carrying his trusty what? Blanket. When he walks out on stage, he begins to recite the, the scripture from Luke's gospel. And when he says, fear not, he drops his blanket. And he stands there and delivers the rest of that scripture. And then as he finishes, he reaches down and he picks up his blanket and he goes back and says, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. The angel comes to tell us that we need not fear. We don't need our trusty blanket. We don't need gadgets and gimmicks to bring us good luck. All we need is to trust in God, 
Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for God has heard your prayer. And you will bear a son, and you will name him John. Now, we go back to the beginning of this text, and, and we're, we're told that, that uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah had not been able to have children. An Old Testament understanding of this would, would suggest that, that somehow, some way, Elizabeth had done something wrong. And that because of her sin, she had been unable to have a child. And what Luke is making sure we understand is that that was not the case in this particular instance. For he makes very clear to say both of them were righteous before God and living blamelessly according to the commandments and regulations of the Lord. And that simply it was a, just a sad case of infertility that had left Elizabeth and Zechariah without children it is important for us to understand that. It also said that, and, and each of the translation are slightly different, but in this, the, the New Revised Standard Version, it says they were getting on in years. Now, I, I'm getting on in years now, having reached the ripe old age of 42, but I've always been careful in how we talk about age, right? So you gotta be careful. It, People don't want to be thought of as too young. They don't want to be thought of as too old. And, and the, the story writer tells us that Elizabeth and Zechariah were getting on in years. But then when told that his wife was going to have a son and he was to name him John, Zechariah says, how will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. He was in a different, difficult conundrum too. He could call himself old, but he, how do I explain the fact that maybe this really isn't possible for Elizabeth? They were getting on in years. They were well beyond the time when they should be able to have a child. It reminds us the Old Testament story of Abram and Sarah. We're reminded that throughout the Bible there are stories of people who are specifically chosen by God to bring another one into the world that would make a difference for generations to come. And so now Zechariah's Fear has turned to confusion. Now, he was a priest. He knew the Hebrew Scriptures. He knew the promises of God. He knew that once Gabriel had identified himself, that this was an angel of God sent to deliver a specific message. But yet, he still didn't believe. He was startled and terrified, and then he was confused, and he didn't understand. This was so unexpected. The whole day was unexpected. Priests wait their whole lives and never get the opportunity to be the one to go into the sanctuary of the Lord and to share the incense. So the very fact that he was chosen was unexpected. He has an unexpected visitor to meet him in that room. And then the most unexpected thing happens, the most unexpected of messages that he and his wife are to have a child. And then the expectations that come with knowing that your child will be the one who will pave the way for the Son of God to bring God's love to the world unexpected and very high expectations that are to come from this incredible, incredible story. Each of us have unexpected things happen to us. Sometimes those things are tragic and terrible and other times they're joyful and wonderful. This week we 
celebrated the anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. A beautiful morning in the Pacific Ocean. A routine day that went horribly wrong. An unexpected attack on our own land. It was something that no one could have expected and we we were first afraid and then we were confused and then we had to figure out what to do. And we continued to give thanks for those who served during that time and continue to serve. It's a horrible, tragic thing that happened. But then we also hear stories of unexpected things that make us smile. Several weeks ago, we, we celebrated the story of the little five-year-old who, whose make-a-wish was to be, a, to be a superhero, and he got to run around San Francisco as Batman for the day. The internet can be a blessing and a curse, but one of the things that's a blessing for me is the, the stories that come and are shared that, that lift me up. Just when I'm kind of feeling down, then I, I can find a story that is something that's unexpected. And my expectations can change. Said a bit about Nelson Mandela in our prayer and And I think the most unexpected thing about him was when he was set free from jail and then he was elected to be the president of South Africa. The expectation was that a man who had lived for 27 years in prison would come out and the first thing that he would want to do would to be seek retribution to those who had wrongly imprisoned him. But everything that I've heard and read says that he led in a most unexpected way. That it was the exact opposite, that he made it clear that there would be no retribution, but there would only be reconciliation. That unless there was a specific crime that could be seen, that those who had in the past done horrible things everyone would start on a fresh page. And then in the last few months, the new Pope of the Roman Catholic Church has said and done a lot of unexpected things. Most recently I read, and I haven't heard this to be uh, um, confirmed, but there is great speculation and, and pretty clear that this Pope is sneaking out of the Vatican at night to go and to give money to the poor. Could you imagine being on the streets of Rome and you look up and the Holy Father is standing there? The most unexpected picture of the last few months has been him embracing and kissing a man with a horrible disease that causes sores to come over his entire body. The man had been reluctant to to have any kind of interviews, but finally his family spoke to the media. And the man, as he and his family had gone to Rome to see the Pope, hoped for a wave or an acknowledgement and was overwhelmed when the Pope came and embraced him and held him, and that picture went viral. His disease is, is uh, it, it's not contagious, but you would think it is because people avoid him at all costs. It's difficult to look at. But Pope Francis leaned in and kissed him and embraced him. An unexpected act that can shock our sensitivities, and cause us to wonder how we should reach out to others in similar unexpected ways. After Zechariah questions the veracity of these claims by this unexpected guest, the angel says, I am Gabriel and I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you to bring you this good news. But now because you did not believe my words, 
you will be unable to to speak until the time at which your child is born. If you know anything about preachers, the worst thing in the world you can do is take away their ability to speak. But it was to be a witness to the people. His silence would be deafening as his wife began to show the sure and certain signs that she was expecting the unexpected. God or God's messengers will continue to knock on our doors throughout this Advent season. And the question is, will we know them when they arrive? What will our expectations be of their visit? And how will we respond in unexpected ways? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Closing hymn this morning is hymn number 230, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Will you stand as we sing?